Carnivore Conversations again with Dr. Rob Kiltz, and I'm really, really excited to bring Dr. Sean Patterson today. Sean uh, is an accomplished trainer, speaker, performance improvement consultant with broad exposure to multiple industries. Uh, he has an entrepreneurial DNA and a knack for improving performance in the professional sports, government, and corporate setting. He has an excellent track record of working with executives, top performers, like all of us, by the way, uh, and high profile clients. He's a pa He is passionate about his work and advanced rapidly in all areas of his profession as a chiropractor to begin with, and also helping people develop their personal best, I think. I'm just going to bring Sean on because I could, I could, I could keep reading and reading and reading, uh, but really great to have you here, Sean. How are you doing, my friend? Thank you, sir. I'm doing fabulous. I, I, well, I, I appreciate you getting through that tongue twister of uh, a bio there. <laughs> well, well, you know, I know and every time someone starts reading my bio, I'm just like, okay, enough, enough, enough. Let's just get to the the, the <laughs> chat because really we, we learn so much by listening and, and uh, getting a chance to ask questions and maybe you tell our, our listeners and those watching a little bit about yourself, where you came from and how'd you get into this, this world of health and wellness? Yeah, uh, like most, you know, life kind of meanders. It doesn't take an A to B course, no matter how hard I try to push A to B. I, I went through a few cul-de-sacs on the way here, I call them. You know, you end up right back where you started, maybe a couple years older. Uh, I grew up in the North Bay, San Francisco North Bay. Um, uh, just kind of born and raised there. Um, had a hippie mom who was really into just strange things. You know, I was chomping on spirulina as a baby and you know, there was rumor of uh, moms eating their placentas back then. And just, I mean, we're talking, I mean, that's the original carnivore stuff, right? Like just crazy stuff. But I always had a real high uh, value for health and, and not by choice in the early years. I was a really heavy adolescent. Uh, mm -hmm. I was, you know, I, I'll never forget, you know, one of my first pediatrician visits in my mind where I'm a big boy, I'm 13, just about to turn 13, you know, in the nurse puts me on the scale and says, Sean, do you know that you're only five foot three and you weigh 200 pounds? And like, you know, like that's revelatory at that point. No, I don't know. I'm the fat right, right. butterball. So I, uh, I was going to prove them all wrong and got into weightlifting and uh, fitness. And I dropped 60 pounds between my, my junior and senior year of high school. And uh, I really fell in love with, with athletics and weight training. I wasn't really good at anything, but I could move weight and I enjoyed that. And, uh, and I started learning more about nutrition and made a lot of mistakes. And fast forward a 23 year chiropractic career, starting mostly with athletes and fitness. And now I've gravitated more towards, I mean, it's, it's, it's a weird week when I don't get somebody coming in saying, they said you could help me. Uh, I have an autoimmune or I can't get pregnant or I have a chronic migraine for 10 years straight and my MDs are at a loss. What could you do for me? Hmm. First, I say is, well, I'm a chiropractor, so I don't treat any of that stuff. Right. But here's how this works. And let's get your body stronger and healthier. So that's kind of what I do. Well, a, a first question a little bit is about that butter boy. And do you think it was the weights? And the lifting that probably was the primary reason you began to um, dump the extra weight uh, by lifting weights, or did you focus a little bit on both the weights and nutrition? Well, you know, the weights came before the weight loss. And as most will learn, and that, that's kind of the, the fitness world, I feel like right now you see all these people that look like, like, like I don't mean to be mean, but like they're like bison or mooses in the gym. They're giant and they they really most people want to lean up, but they're lifting weights and they don't know how to diet. Right. So they're just getting bigger and stronger, but they're not getting less body composition, we'll just say. And so I, that was me. All of a sudden I went from, you know, I'm I'm overweight, but now I'm overweight and really strong. And I like the strong part. But until I started changing my nutrition, I didn't see the fat loss coming off. And I kind of stumbled upon the weight loss. It was, you, you want me to tell you what that was? Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, I know. think, uh, really important. Well, it's funny. I Like I do everything the wrong way. And then I look back and go, okay, that's why that worked. So I was lifting weights, but, but it wasn't taking body fat off me. Well, come, I lived in a pretty rough area and I had to take the bus. Mm -hmm. And when you're the fat kid and you're the last bus stop, you don't want to take the bus. And especially when you live in real, you know, ghetto style apartments, it's embarrassing. And so I, I told my mom, I'm not taking on that bus. And my mom said, well, 
I'm a single mom working three jobs. It looks like you're walking. I said, looks like I'm walking. So I started walking three miles each way to school. And to be honest, you know, we struggled financially. There wasn't a lot of food in the house. So I just said, you know what, this walking thing, maybe if I don't eat, I'll lose some weight too. So I, I kind of stumbled upon six miles a day and only eating after 4 p.m. And I mean, I dropped, I mean, I had to live in sweatpants for six months. I was losing body fat like crazy. And uh, so not the healthiest way of doing it, but in a lot of ways, maybe a lot healthier than a lot of the diet plans and fitness plans I'm, I'm seeing out there right now. How were you feeling at the time mentally? I felt really good. Um, but some of that was, you know, that, that's kind of where the spirituality and insecurities and all that comes in, because I went back to school, you know, and people didn't even know me. And all of a sudden, you know, people wanted to know me, especially those girls. And I thought, wow. I mean, I'm the same person, but, you know, it, it kind of inflated my head and gave me motivations that weren't the best idea. And it almost became like an addictive thing to working out more and, and, and you know, the attention gained from it, it wasn't a real healthy way of doing it, but it was working um, for a, a while. It was hmm. working and then started the chronic pain. And well, tell us a little bit about the chronic pain and then how did you get into the chiropractic world? Well, perfect question I, I was doing heavy squats because that was the one thing i wasn't a bench press guy i mean you might be the bench press guy i mean i'm starting to i'm starting to develop the upper body now at almost 50 years old but i was the leg guy so i was squatting heavy weights for my body weight and uh i just remember going down one time i was 15 years old and i came back up and i got that pinch I went, yep. Ooh. and then i tried to walk it off work it out go sit in the hot tub did all the things wrong heated the heck out of it didn't know about ice back then i just tried to work through it and, and it really it started a lifelong chronic back problem with herniated discs and all kinds of things and uh uh i didn't really i wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon that was what i thought i was going to do and uh i didn't like the way the kind of medical paradigm was working with things like that because they did it, it's almost like if it's not bad enough we don't have anything for you kid just go you know ice it take some ibuprofen and uh and it'll work itself out and i kept doing that cycle and it kept getting worse and worse and worse and I had some other sports injuries you know i'm not a golfer so naturally i hit the ground before the ball and really hurt my wrist you know and uh, all these little things and, and and you know i just had a friend who said hey go see this chiropractor friend of mine i go what's that that's weird i said but you know i like the popping cracking kind of thing and they worked me over and i'm not even kidding you i came out of there and i could see better and it's been wow. a real strange thing my vision has gotten better as i mean I, the last eye doc eye appointment i had they said you don't need your glasses anymore and I mean, I, I just turned 50, 49 this last weekend and at you know, 45 years old, they said, I, I don't know if we got it wrong. I'm like, well, I've been wearing those things for a decade and they were helping and now they're not. And they said, yeah, you don't need them. That's why they're messing your eyes up. So, uh, you know, I went, OK, so chiropractic seemed like a really good thing. And, and like we were talking about before, uh, there is an entrepreneurship kind of to that because you could kind of forge your own way. And uh, so I said, the heck with it. I'm going to do that. And I kind of just went for it and you know i was already in all these pre-med classes so it was an easy pivot and and because it is interesting that on the on the surgical side it's 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 a, a pill or a procedure and but chiropractic is a little bit more focused on the 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 total mind and body would you say that falls a little bit more into Absolutely. I mean, at the at the core of of my schooling and why I chose to go to school in California, the East Bay at, at a school called Life was their whole thing was, look, the power that made the body can heal the body. Yeah. And I like that because I'm a very faithful person and, and I believe in miracles and I believe that's we're all meant to walk in some sort of divine health. Now, we've goofed that up real bad. But it doesn't mean we're still not to meant we're, we're still not meant to walk that way, and uh, yeah. Now, now, given my my profession, I mean, I don't know about your profession, but I'm not joking. I've walked into events where there are people wearing purple robes with crystal balls in their hand, literally. I, I mean, I joked about it, and I went to this conference, and that's the first thing I saw in the foyer, and I started. Dying. I'm taking pictures, tell my wife, you won't believe this, and then I have friends that are practically surgeons. And, and, and they go so far, I'm like, why don't you just go to med school and become a surgeon on top? And they, some do. And so we have a lot of freedom in that, that we're less regulated state to state versus like most medical establishments. And I like that, but it's also a tough grind too, right? It's a tough yeah, grind. Yeah. But yes, 
to, to answer your question, power that made the body heals the body. And I like that. I like that a lot. And, and tell us a little bit about your journey into faith and spirituality. I've been listening to a number of your YouTube uh, uh, videos, and it seems to me that there is a spirituality in your your guidance and direction that is powerful. Yeah, I appreciate that question because I really feel sometimes I look back at my life and I I'm hard on myself and I, oh, I should have done this or made that decision. But I really, if I stop being that way, so self-critical, right. I look back and I go, I do believe there's been a, a kind of a divine path for my life. I mean, uh, the, one of the, the favorite uh, prophets of old time, Jeremiah says, Hey, stand at the crossroads and look. And, and I like that. He says, stand there, wait, look for the eternal way or the ancient way. And then when you find it, walk on it. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of been what I, I feel like uh, my life's been like um, when I take the time to stop at the crossroad, not just go up, oh, we're hanging a left, we're hanging a right. No, no, it's stop and wait, you know? And um, I mean, I was a very kind of spiritual guy. Um, like I said, my mom was kind of a hippie and um, came from a Catholic background. And I, I had a reverence for God and I'd pray, but no, nothing organized, nothing really like, you know, it was kind of the God of my own understanding. And uh, but one day at 23 years old, I was heading to I used to work weekends at Costco and I went to graduate school in the East Bay by Oakland and I worked in Santa Rosa and I'd go up there and just couch surf and work the weekends to get through school. And I'm on the Richmond Bridge of all places and I hear an audible voice. Uh, I mean, and I got my rap music on loud, sir. I mean, it is loud. And I, I had the bass, you know, I can't believe my, I, my ears still work. But uh, it's, it's clear as day. Go to church three words. And I felt like that was the first time in my life I heard the voice of God. And I don't know if it was audible, audible, but it was loud in my head. And so I go to work. I'm thinking that's pretty strange. Long story short, I get to work within three minutes of clocking in. I had the change key, you know, to the vault and everything. So when other departments like the Photoshop and the hot dog stand needed change, they came to me. First guy walks up. I'm there three minutes. He's got his hundred dollar bill. I'm like, I need some change. Hey, what's up, Jeff? Uh, He goes, nothing. What are you doing tonight? thinking nothing. I've never partied with this guy. He goes, Hey, I'm having a church thing. You want to come with me? And I just sat there like, okay. Uh, yes. And it, and it great, great. I'll meet you out front after work. And he walks away. I go, what did I just say yes to? But it was so clear in my mind. And, and anyway, that started a journey of, um, you know, here I am 25 years later and I, I'm still on that journey, but it really changed me to more of like, Oh, Oh, oh God is, God is different than just ambiguous out there. I mean, God's in all nature, but like for me, God became more personified, I I guess we'd say. Do you think in some way in standard medical care, we're missing that spiritual component? Yeah, I think so. I think, uh, I I like, uh, I think the spirit in all of us wants to heal. And sometimes it leads us to a surgeon or to a medical doctor for a drug. I have no problem with those things. But sometimes we quickly can take over with our will and our logical mind and we stifle that small, still voice. You know, well, the guidelines are this or the gold standard is this. And and I feel like the spirit of God's like, hey, no, no problem, guys. This is a free will kind of gig. When you invite me back in, I will speak to you what you want to do or what I want to do for you. That whole self-healing thing. But if you choose this and you want to be intellectual and prideful and stubborn and or or no more than me i'll let you and so yeah I, but i meet doctors who are really open uh to that and and their practices are different i'm sure your practice is different because you obviously right i would i'm assuming that you try to operate from you know that kind of paradigm well i i, I often ask people if they believe in god and i either get a yes or a no Uh, but I believe in a higher power. Mm -hmm. And then I I asked the question, well, what does that mean for you? And how do you use it in your day-to-day health and wellness in your life? Because I think in modern medicine, we just, we forget about it. Mm. And ultimately I think it is the most important thing because it guides and drives and directs all of the other stuff. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to believe in God. You don't have to go to church. Uh, but it's something I think it's the pos- the power of positive thinking or the, the power of some path of thinking, just like their ideas of, of physical activity or nutrition or even when it comes to Western 
uh, treatment modalities. And I kind of consider it chiropractic a little bit of a Western modality in some mm-hmm. ways. Yeah. But then yeah. it, it, it brings in the Eastern philosophy and the ideas that I think in Western medicine we haven't really touched very much. I think I agree completely. And I think if you really pulled out a lot of organizing bodies and maybe the mechanics of how people get paid and the codes and the bills, and we really sat down, oh my gosh, we'd rock this thing. We, we'd rock this thing. Well, well, tell us a little bit about um, the nutritional side of, of what your thoughts are on health and wellness. Yeah, thank you. Um, so it's always been dear to me just because I knew I was doing it wrong. I mean, very much an emotional eater. This is, you know, those uh, single serve uh, half gallons of ice cream, you know, the yeah. cylindrical kind, many of those in my life. And I mean, it really hit me when I was uh, in my early 20s and I went to, to visit my father, who I really didn't have a relationship with, mm. but I was trying to cultivate that. And I remember that whole tension of, oh, do, do I want to be here? Do I not want to be here? This is so awkward. And hard. And my first thing was, you got to get out of this house and go to the store and get some ice cream. And I realized that was like my heroin. It was like, you know, because my mom was an ex heroin addict. Mm. And it's so funny how I wasn't a heroin addict, but you better believe I was still an addict. And, and it was sugar carbohydrates. Um, I came from a big Italian family and it was lots of great seafood from North Bay. I mean, we still have fishing. My uncle still manages the California Seafood Company, I believe, last time I checked. And so a whole lifelong of, of great seafood and proteins, but always the, the French bread and the pastas yeah. and the sauces. And so I was an emotional eater. And uh, so when I lost that weight, I, I, you know, unfortunately, it was it was all about calories, really, for me, you know, and I, I just ruined my metabolism over over decades. And, and when I got into my 30s and started having children, I you know got married, started a practice and had four children. And uh, I really started going, OK, I, I can't calorie the weight off anymore i'm slowly gaining weight Mm -hmm. um you know i blinked and i was like 35 pounds heavier in fact facebook i shared it with my family this morning they just gave me one of those 11 or 12 year memories and i'm i was 187 pounds and today i'm 150 even wow how did that get there i'm at my fighting weight again but um yeah so food so the first thing when i said i got to reel this back in um it was the gluten-free thing because i had a son with gluten antibodies and and that was kind of it's kind of, I look back and go, well, that was cute. I mean, that, that did a little bit, right? It really just got me off probably eating so much flowers, really all it did. But as we know, gluten, gluten-free became a, a thing. And uh, for some, it, it is really beneficial, but it's just a first step or a piece. And then I went into, um, and I did that for years. And But when I really started, I, I went ketogenic about three and a half, four years ago. The last thing I gave up were those corn chips and corn tortillas. And oh, it was so hard. And, uh, and I slow, and, but here's the problem with the ketogenic diet for me. And, and when I go all in, I go all in. So yeah. I was, I was tracking and calculating. I was down to about 1700 calories a day with pretty intense exercise. I mean, I was, I had no metabolism. Um, my macros were, uh, you know, probably about hundred grams of protein, you know, 80 to hundred grams of protein, uh, 10% carbs. So I'd get under 50 grams of carbs a day and really most days 40. And that was just incidental through right nuts some vegetables hmm. um, and a little bit of dairy, but I was always hungry. I was always cold and I hurt like heck still. Um, you know, obviously wow. uh, stress did a number on my adrenal system, lost my hair, gained weight, major insulin issues and blood sugar issues. And, uh, and, and so just up until, I mean, I'm a five month carnivore today. It wow. was April 5th, five nice. months ago, say September 5th. And it's been wild when I just took out the only thing I was eating, sir, nuts. And I was very specific. I was on like Poliquin's, uh, you know, Charles Poliquin was a great, you know, weightlifting trainer, Olympic trainer. And I, I did what he said, meat and nuts in the morning. It was only Brazil nuts and uh, uh, maybe macadamia nuts. Um, I, I, I had a little bit of cheese. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. That wasn't plant. I had a little bit of uh, cauliflower. Um, some artichoke and and maybe and just lettuces. Those that, that was the only vegetables I was eating, and my stomach was killing me all the time. And I gave those things up because you know Jordan Peterson and then Michaela and people keep mentioning this carnivore thing. And then I went on Instagram, and then you know once you do that, the, the whole world is talking carnivore and you know my social media. So I said the heck with it, I'm going to do it. And uh, whew, that was the transition, and it was a it was a rough transition. The first two weeks were bliss. I've never felt such a sense of wellness. Like my mind felt so clear. I felt just strong and warm. 
I immediately was able to eat 500 calories more a day and I lost weight for the first mm. two weeks. I mean, I looked like I, I leaned up like for a year for me because I'm, I'm slow going. Um, and then, then the hiccups came, right? And you could probably speak to what those are, but the digestive hiccups, you know, the don't, the, the don't trust your gas kind of thing. Oh my goodness. And then, and then it went to the other extreme where for the first time in my life I had I didn't have like an irritable bowel. I had like constipation, which maybe it was, maybe it wasn't now learning things, but I definitely, my electrolytes were off cramps and sleep trouble. And then my mind got weird. And and I'm telling you, it's been five months and I feel like I've just worked out the kinks. And, uh, and, and so that's been my nutritional journey. Do you think it's simply withdrawing from the drug? I think the microbiome withdrawing, because as we both know that the microbiome is, yeah, I mean, there's the sugar withdrawal, but I was already done with that. I wasn't eating any sugar. I mean, you could say I went from 40 carbs to 10 a day, maybe some, some days zero. I don't think it was that. I think it was when I stopped putting all that uh, carbohydrate or fiber into my gut, I think those bugs got mad and yeah. they probably started dying off. And, and because how else could I explain my mind, my moods, my behaviors changing? It's almost like who's in there pulling the strings on this. And, you know, I really, I really felt that's, that's what it was, that withdrawal, but a lot from the gut. Well, it's interesting because I believe that it's not just sugar. It's the phytochemicals. Heroin is a plant product. Mm. And we are all consuming a tremendous amount of heroin-like substances that are the real killers. It's wild those, to think because we don't compare those. No, we don't. But if you actually look at plant chemicals, they're opiate-like. Mm. And, so, and so it's not just sugar. See, we, we mostly fo focus on sugar, but the plant antigens, lectins, oxalates, phytates, and then the plant chemicals, the phytochemicals, the oxalates, I'm sorry, the, the, the estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and then the opiate-like substances that are in all plants. Mm. And so my theory on drug addicts is you are actually encouraged to be a drug addict because of the plant-based diet. Wow. And then once you touch heroin, you get the, you get the real hit of what the plants have been doing all along. Makes sense. And so it's hard to withdraw off of plants. It's not the sugar. It's the heroin. Wow. Well, or the heroin like substances. Well, you're exactly right. Cause I had already done the sugar. I had really yeah. already done the sugar. And I mean, it was, I, I don't cheat. I mean, I, I'm the kind of person, if I'm going to quote cheat, I, I don't like the language. I tell people do what you want, but you if treat. I'm going to um, have something, I'm not going to order my own. I'm not even going to share. I'm going to say, you put that in front of you and I'm going to be rude and reach over with my fork. And I'm going to do once or twice. And, and that's how I roll because I know myself. I'll turn yeah. back into that junkie. But the last thing, it's so funny that you say that. Here was the deal breaker for me that really sent me into carnivore. I, I, I just kept eliminating, kept eliminating, kept feeling better. Got rid of avocados. Wow, my stomach feels better. Got rid yeah. of broccoli. My stomach feels better. All the things I'm telling my patients for decades to eat too. I look back, I'm so sorry, guys. I'm so sorry. I, you know, but it was still better than the sad diet for most of them, right? Well, well, we, I mean, I, for sure. I mean, we all go back and whatever we shared, we thought it was right, mm -hmm. but we learned it from others and you feel better right. uh, in many ways, but it just doesn't cure like carnivore cures right well so my last plant i remember I, I have this tendency sometimes just you know food is just you know it's like a just a mechanical thing and my wife's like sean we're sitting down to eat don't sit there and eat lunch meat standing at the counter like a refugee okay I'll come sit down but i wanted to be a big boy like the family so i get a plate i don't want to eat out of the container and i got romaine nice beautiful organic romaine leaves snapped about or they were the, the cup kind because they were having some sort of lettuce wrap and they were the nice little round one. They were beautiful. No bugs eating them. I'm thinking organic, which now I, in hindsight, I'm like, well, why weren't the bugs eating them? I lay like five of those on my plate and I just get turkey meat. And I eat this turkey meat every day, all day. No problem. After I ate those within 10 minutes, I am dying. Like my stomach is killing me. And it went through the night. And it was almost like, you know, you talk about the spiritual part of things. Yeah. That was almost like a spiritual intervention. And I, I go, there's no way it's romaine lettuce. 
And sure enough, like I think the next day, I believe I, I, I heard, I didn't even listen to it. I just saw on YouTube, uh, Dr. Chafee's plants are trying to kill you. And it all just started like a puzzle making sense. I'm going, no, but that withdrawal after that was wild. And that was really one of the last, I mean, the last plant materials I was eating. So I eat occasional French fries dipped in a ton of either sour cream or lard or duck grease that's like oh, poured over my steak or my, you know, a little bit, but that's once in a while, mm -hmm. you know, the fatty meat and the bacon, eggs, butter, beef, like is the standard. I occasionally will snack uh, uh, or, or treat, but I don't ever cheat. Mm -hmm. I uh, like that. It's a and I don't ever eat green vegetables, fruit, fiber, seeds, or nuts. Cause those are the real killers. Yeah. Who would have thought? I mean, I went to Europe early on in this and I only did treats four times on 11 day. I'm on the Amalfi Coast and in Barcelona, but the meat was great. You know, I just, people think you can't do that. Sure, I can. They, eggs and meat. Um, and I had, I decided to have pizza twice. I had gelato. No, I had pizza once in Rome. No problem. It was very strange. It was just, just cheese and meat. I had pasta, I think once or twice. And I had gelato once or twice. And that was it the whole trip. Um, and one night though, I was at a wedding. That's why I was there and my stomach felt great. I, and I just laughed. I go, well, I know the stuff will fat me up if I eat too much of it, but I felt great. I felt fine. I chewed on some green olives. Only night of the whole trip. I was up with stomach aches all night, wow. green olives. I'm thinking what better food than a green olive, my something in the skin. And obviously, you know, more than I, it's amazing though. I still, it's hard to believe when I tell people, they just think I'm nuts. We are. <laughs> so the microbiome. So I have my theory that the microbiome is deadly for us. And that the microbes don't belong in our bowels. They don't belong in our skin, in, in, in our subcutaneous tissue or our bloodstream or our organs. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'm just curious your thoughts because you said that it may be the microbes are fighting you. Yeah. And I was reading a paper where they fed cows 30% of the calories from either canola oil or coconut oil and the cows died. <laughs> and what they found is that the, the rumen was sterile. Hmm. Because the microbes Holy were sterile. killed by the fat. So, so no even healthy microbes is what you're theorizing. Well, well the, the question is, if you have a microbe in your bloodstream, is it healthy? No. Then how is it we think the microbes in our gut are good for us? Right. So maybe we can handle a certain amount of incidental microbes, but this whole philosophy of well, there's healthy ones and they're supposed to be there and they need fiber and we should live harmoniously with them. I, I don't think that theory is working. It, it is not. And, and I mean, I was just talking to a, a, an internal, no, a family practice doc today. And she says, well, the, the majority of the people in the ICU are all septic. And where wow. are they getting the bugs from? Right. It's likely from the bowels. Yeah. Leaking out of the bowels. Right. So the, so we're feeding all of us, a plant-based diet, which breaks down to sugar, which feeds the microbes. And so the microbes are flourishing. They're damaging the, the, the glycobiome, the, the sugar coating of the gut that protects us. Leaky gut. Mm -hmm. And then it just happens that the doctors and the scientists have convinced us there are good, good bacteria and bad bacteria. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that is a, a known belief. It, it, that's It's a, it's a known belief. Yeah. 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 Any thoughts on that? It's... I've never stopped to think about the idea of good versus bad. And you know, who really helped me. I love that you mentioned, uh, uh, Professor Bart K. And he's really great. He would correct me on the cholesterol. There's no good and bad. There's just cholesterol, right? So instead of looking at it, at that reductionist model of, well, we see this or that, how about we just look at it from a bigger picture? Maybe like you're saying, microbes or no microbes. And just because we have a tolerance 
We don't need to build a whole philosophy that they should be there because everybody's full of them. It is fascinating. I, I, I do know um, one thing that's always stuck with me is when I got out of school, I remember reading about a, a company in the UK, or not a company, but a, a group of people, and they were doing the GAPS diet, G-A-P-S, and it stood for Gut and Psychological Syndrome. And they were claiming to heal schizophrenia and autism through the gut. And, and I always wondered, so it put in my mind that, oh, it's the good bacteria that are good, but but maybe if we take that piece aside and just say it's about lowering the ones that are more dangerous, that is very likely what's happening there. Or the number of bugs in your belly, that's it's really it, because when you have yeah. low counts, your immune system is able to keep them at bay and keep them in the gut and not mm -hmm. in the bloodstream. Dr. Rob Kiltz, another beautiful, spectacular day. And I just want to send thanks to all of those for watching the newest episode of Carnivore Conversations. Be sure to follow us on Spotify, Apple Music, and other streaming platforms to gain access to the full one hour episode. And don't forget to like and subscribe for more to come. God bless.